to build a great culture, it really is a journey and not a destination. I've always said that culture and great places to work, it can happen anywhere. You could be running a business that has nothing glamorous about it and still make it a great place to work if you focus on it. Our guest today works for an industry that I know all too well, printing. It's not glamorous. It's got tight margins. It's very competitive. It's not easy. And he has created an amazing place to work. People don't leave. And if they do, they come back. Um, they're profitable and are able to give an enormous amount of money back to their community. And he's created a legacy. It's one thing to wake up every day and be excited to go to work. But it's even better to know that you have created a place for people to feel that way. Our guest today, Jay Wilkinson, has done all this and more with his business, Firespring, based out of Lincoln, Nebraska. He is fascinating because he's actually been fired from this job and was and rebounded and has also learned some really tough lessons over the years. Jay has appeared on CNN and other news outlets discussing the evolution of purpose-driven companies and is considered a leading authority on social entrepreneurship, modern marketing practices, and the nonprofit sector. Jay Wilkinson, welcome to How I Turned the Corner. Thank you. It is my honor and pleasure to be here. I need to have you uh, introduce me to my children again. That was just a wonderful and fantastic introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. I'm happy to do that. As long as you reciprocate for my kids too. They're like, of oh, course. she just wants people to like their job. <laughs> yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Well, so tell us about your journey. Tell us about Firespring. Like, I think people need to hear what's kind of been your, your story. <clears throat> um, you know, Firespring is a, a, a perpetual... Uh, work in progress, and and it will be always. Um, it's that's one of the fundamental aspects of how I see uh, this company and and what we do. Uh, we did we got our start in the printing in the printing industry back in the '90s. Um, jumped into the website development business in the mid '90s. Actually, won the Backstreet Boys Band website in 1996, um, and then started doing that for for clients. Pivoted out. Um, uh, really away from just solely a, a printing company in the early 2000s and became a software as a service business that serves printing companies then that later launched software as a service products that serve nonprofit organizations. So we now have thousands of clients in uh, 14 countries on six continents and in all 50 states um, that uh, use our tools and technology to manage their nonprofit organizations, website and marketing and email and all of those things. And then also for, for large printing companies, uh, we still have a couple thousand of those that use the tools that we built to help them bring their business online in a, in a meaningful way. And uh, so that's that's where, where we've been focused. Lately, my focus has been more on the work I do in and around the Do More Good movement, which is a, a movement to help um, educate and inspire and amplify companies and the leaders of those companies uh, to pursue a path to purpose in their business and to serve all of the stakeholders of their of their company, not just the owner slash shareholders of the business. And so that's where the vast majority of my time is today. Oh, that's great. Are you familiar with uh, John Wood's book, Purpose Incorporated? Yes. I yes. Am. Oh, great. We're going to have him on the podcast here soon too. So he's fabulous. Got such a great story around the fifth P, right? Yeah, there, there are so many amazing people doing great work. And that's what I love being around this space is, you know, like the old Stephen Covey term of scarcity. You know, there's so many industries and businesses, whatever, um, even nonprofit organizations where it's like, well, it's us versus them. You know, if there are three different types of organizations that serve families, for example, just using this as a, as a random example, um, maybe families with Down syndrome, those organizations are going like, you know, well, we're doing this better and, you know, and, and like competing against each other. And um, in this space, from what I've witnessed and seen, the practitioners and the brilliant people like yourself that are doing amazing work, building company culture and building purpose, there seems to be this rising tide lifts all boats, this abundance mindset instead of a scarcity mindset. It's just such a, a joy to be working in a space where that fundamental premise is just um, um, inherent 
Yeah. It's a lot more lovely to do business that way than yeah. to be in the state of stress and cortisol and adrenaline competing <laughs> yes. and feeling like you're, you know, you're going to lose everything if, if you don't uh, act in a cutthroat way. Mm-hmm. And yet that still is carrying through so many cultures. And so, um, I mean, tell us about some of the things you've noticed with just your own business around, you know, how that's changed and why, why, why it's so different for you. Yeah. You know, the uh, I, I've talked to so many of my peers in uh, in the YPO and EO worlds and 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 these these large organizations that just really are a, a, a bastion of of compassion and and um, of connection for entrepreneurs like uh, like myself. And I hear over and over and over again how everything's changed. Everything's changed so fast. You know, we went from a, a work in the office culture to a work from home culture. Um, by force. And, uh, you know, essentially what I've heard said many times is many people believe that what has happened was bound to happen, but maybe over a 10 year, 12 year period. And we just fast forwarded it into two and a half years. And here we are. And my own company has experienced this without question of around 200 people in our organization where 95% of us worked in the office every day prior to the pandemic we are now less than 50% of the people working in the office every day. There's some hybrid and um, uh, or, or a completely work from home uh, understanding that is now acceptable and um, not just acceptable, but desirable by so many people in terms of how they connect. Um, and then there are others that crave, they have to have that human connection in the office and they feel lonely and isolated when they're not in the office. And we're still trying to figure all this out. We're still juggling it and working through it. We're incredibly committed to, to getting it right. And the only way I know how to do that is to make sure that everybody has a voice. Um, every single human um, in our organization is expected, not just you know, invited to, but expected to bring their ideas to the table um, mm-hmm. and to share what's best for them and what they believe is best for the company. And our mantra is find a better way, find a better way. And we say that all the time. We have a daily meeting at 1111 every day. We've been doing this for over 15 years. And at the daily meeting, we're sharing the better ways. We're recognizing each other for living our values and we're holding each other up and um, just spreading love and light and compassion and giving grace to all those around us um, constantly so that we um, we're, we're, we're always evolving, but so much has changed that I guess is what I'm really saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet the fundamental underpinnings of what makes us human and what makes humans work together in a business that hasn't changed even a bit. It's still, mm-hmm. still there. Yeah. I, I think one of the big messages I think needs to get out to my other leaders is, um, we can't just assume that the way it's been done is the way it's always going to be done. I mean, if anything, because of the speed of, of change that occurred during COVID, I think we almost are forced to iterate even faster now. Mm -hmm. And nobody thinks about iterating on culture. You know, they think, oh, this is what we've done. We've always been in office. Well, what if you do change it? Like, why? Why can't it be that way? Or, you know, we won't, we won't hire and even think about having a part-time workforce. Why? Right. Like just keep iterating and asking those questions because I think there's a huge amount of opportunity when you really start to say, I'm going to be, you know, more in a growth mindset with this than a fixed mindset and just ask those questions. And so I love that you're inviting and you're actually expecting the team to bring some of those ideas forth too, because it's, they're asking those questions behind the scenes and maybe not to us as leaders. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So what have you, what have been some of the big changes you've made in the last, let's say month even, what have you changed? Well, we, we continue, um, well, we, we changed a lot of things in terms of our processes that weren't really in sync with a hybrid culture um, where you know, most of our core processes that we've developed over the many years we've been in business have been built and established for people that are physically present in a workforce and um, really bringing everything into some kind of digital or hybrid format where you can embrace and follow and find and, and really understand at a deep level all of the core processes, you know, at least the 20% of the, of the things that, that yield 80% of the output of our business are now documented and, and, and available in such a way that it's accessible to every team member, regardless of where they are. 
Um, we've also changed just some of our fundamental, I, I mentioned we have a daily meeting at 11, 11 every day, been doing it forever. Well, that meeting has changed dramatically. You know, we used to have, we have three locations, uh, one in Lincoln, Nebraska, one in Omaha, Nebraska, and a third in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And in each of our three locations, we would have a separate 11 minute meeting at 11, 11. So each team would, would all come together and recognize each other for living our values, share better ways, um, remove any obstacles, report on how we're doing, and then go back to work, right? And now we are all doing one meeting. So in a way, the hybrid culture thing has allowed us to bring everybody together in one meeting. So we have technology in three physical spaces in all three of our facilities that automatically turn on at 11.07 a.m. And then people gather. And when the meeting starts, it automatically turns on the cameras. It automatically turns on the audio. And where you're standing or sitting at your desk or on your mobile device when you're out in the field, wherever you are, you're participating in that daily meeting. Um, and that, that's been one thing that has um, surprisingly enhanced the quality of our time together and, and the way that we uh, move through days because the pandemic has made it possible to have this multi-dimensional um, communication every day. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, so you had, you mentioned earlier that 50% of your team is now kind of more in office, whereas before almost everybody was, yeah. how has that felt for you? How's that been? It's difficult. It's, it's, it's been really hard for me. Um, and it's been really hard for a lot of our people, you know, the people that have been with us for 20 years plus that, um, you know, have been part of the, of the culture that we built and curated and, uh, you know, with intention really put a lot of effort into, um, and, uh, like I just had a discussion with the members of our culture club, which is the group that, um, kind of represents all of our other team members, um, about how we can continue to work on ways to make those people that have chosen to work from home to, to help, help them feel more connected because we keep hearing, um, because we, we ask, we're, we're always asking our team, how you doing, you know, wh where's your head? And we have a really good rhythm of making sure that everyone feels seen and heard and connected. But yet those that are working from home all day, even though they're they're talking to people on Slack or whatever, they don't have that physical connection of being in the room with someone. Um, and that's hard. It's been really difficult for me. And I'm an introvert um, and I'm still struggling with it. Um, it's, it's not easy, um, but uh, but I believe that it is um, it's reality and it's um, it's necessary for us to continue down this path. I don't believe it's in, at least in our company, and certainly every business leader and every every manager has their own um, uh, their own decisions to make around this. But I don't believe in the concept of like putting your foot down and demanding that everyone come into the office. Um, I and, and I know there are businesses and companies that can do that, and that will still find people flocking to their gates, wanting to apply and work for that business. All the power to them. I think that. Um, I think it's it's not um, the right amount of reverence and respect to the people that have been with us for 10, 15, 20 years, um, even though their like modality of wanting to work has changed. I think that we should accommodate them as long as they continue to perform and bring it at high levels, we should accommodate them. So it's but it's really hard to do that when you know you're building this thing that where people feel less connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I've always run turning the corner my business. Uh, very flexible. So uh, I've always, so I opened in 2011. And since day one, it's been just come as you are, come when you want, but get the work done. Yeah. And I had an office space that people would come and go and, you know, as they please. Um, but it was no enforcement to it at all. And so when the pandemic hit, it really was like no big deal for us at all. Um, except that I do feel that remote fatigue a little bit now. Like I, I just, people would just randomly pop in. And when I was at the office, there was always somebody there you could interact with and sort of, you know, brainstorm with or riff with on something. Yeah. And I think it's those things I just sort of miss, but I, I want to definitely challenge the ones that are people who think that everybody has to come back together because work isn't getting done. Cause that is not true. You give people freedom as well as just a goal to go after, like people yeah. are going to get the work done. It's not a trust thing. I don't think. Yeah, I agree a thousand percent on that. 
So, so then with, with your current culture, like what are some of the fun things you are doing to build? I mean, I've read of all, you know, in the research I did on you, all the different things you've done over the years and um, your wow wall and, you know, various things that you mentioned even in your TEDx talk, but like, what are you doing now from, to kind of bring this hybrid environment together culturally? We, one thing we're doing is, is we're not panicking um, and um, we're, we're not, like trying to change everything to kind of lean into what, where we feel the wind blowing. We're being very mindful about um, a thoughtful approach to everything and being consistent in analyzing and assessing the changes we're making. So that's one thing. And I have friends that run companies where they've just made these instant things and regretted it, you know, and it's been difficult. But because of the culture that we've that we have and that we've built over the years of, of a, a culture of accountability to each other and trust, um, you know, of, of our three values, my favorite is give a shit, um, and um, that value is so imbued into the way that everybody in this organization thinks. Um, um, you know, and back in the day when we set our values, you know, more than a decade ago. I was, um, I fought against using the word, you know, a four letter word in our value statement. I thought it was a horrible idea. I envisioned like the, you know, the nonprofits that were like religious or, you know, saying, I don't want to do business with a company that has the word shit and their core values or whatever. And I, I fought against it, but I'm so glad I lost that battle. It, um, it, it just, it, people know what it means and they know how to live out the value, which is a critical component of value setting without question. And for us, um, what we're doing and what we're focused on um, as we as we continue to care deeply about each other, to have each other's backs and to give one another the grace that is necessary um, that we would want in return if 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 uh, if we're not able to um, be at a um, at a meeting or if we don't get all of our goals for the quarter or whatever done, um, we have a little bit different, um, expectation of each other we have during the pandemic. And now that we're kind of not coming out of it, I know that still this is going to be around for, you know, a long, long time. We all we all can see that now. Uh, at least, you know, the COVID thing will be around for a long, long time. Um, but but this mindset of of just covering for each other and having each other's backs and supporting one another um, has risen way high up in the organization in a way that is really healthy for our team and for our organization. Uh, we thought we were doing great with that before COVID, but now we know um, we're really doing great. We just we recently had a team member pass away, um, and he's he was just the salt of the earth, just an amazing human being. His name was Josh, and Josh headed up a big portion of of our press um, and bindery teams. Um, and when our team, the of the employees of our of our business who like worked with Josh went to his funeral service, you know, the people from our company outnumbered the people from his family. Mm -hmm. And the tears were flowing and the and the people were standing, you know, talking about this amazing human. Um, and Josh's family, you know, to this day, you know, when we have when any of us run into somebody and they find, oh, you're from Fire Spring, oh my gosh. Um, it's it, they're they're just so mind blown about how we showed up and we care and we have each other's backs. And um, I, I just had a story shared with me yesterday from that's why it's fresh in mind that one, one of our team members just ran into a cousin of Josh's um, and she broke down into tears instantly when she found out that she worked for Firespring because of the connection. Um, and I, it's just it's those kind of things. It's the, it's the human, um, it, it's, it's the progressively human nature of how we see each other and how we support each other that drives our culture today. And, and it's, it's just heightened so much as, as a result of the pandemic. So why do you think so many leaders are like get itchy when they, when we hear things like that? I mean, I'll, I'm a part of a community here in Colorado that our tagline is like love and business can go together. <laughs> and so I love and it. Yeah. But I mean, I run into people who are like, Oh, you know, I mean, why is that when it, this is a human relationship, it is a community. Yeah. I just you don't know, understand it. What do you think like, it is? There's so much um, data um, th th that supports the concept of love, belonging in business. Um, 
um, so much out there. I, I used to do like an entire hour long you know, keynote presentation on this topic on love belongs in, in business context. Um, and many friends and uh, I'm sure many people that are tuning into this um, have read some of the books that have been written about love as the killer app and you know, you know uh, uh, love as it uh, as it applies to business. I, I you know we're all we're all human. Um, every one of us that work for a company and every human wants to be part of something that's that's bigger than themselves. It doesn't matter what they do, what their role is in an organization to be part of something. That 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 is bigger than themselves. Like the old story of you know when John Kennedy was at NASA and he was going down the line shaking hands and he said, "What do you do, sir?" And he said, "I send people to the moon." It turns out he was the janitor, right? And but he was bought into this mission of I'm sending people to the moon. Um, and to me, that's what love does in an organization. It it brings everybody. Um, it kind of uh, just kind of bathes everybody in this this light of 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 just um, love and caring and compassion for one another. Um, and it makes it possible for us to lean into the purpose of a business, whatever it is, and even to affect the purpose of a company or a business in a positive way. It doesn't always have to come from the CEO or founder or whomever. It, it can come from anywhere in an organization, anyone who leads with their heart first um, and leans into um, using what that means to bring people around them and to um, and to create moments and opportunities in a business where you can show compassion and you can show love. Um, it is magical and it's not so mysterious because we all know about it, but so often to your point, business leaders think, well, that's that's something for you know for over there. That's for weekends and evenings when I'm with family at church, whatever. I can express my love there. Um, and uh, I, I just I believe that the more we are open and about love in itself in terms of the the, the people around us, um, the better off we'll all be. <laughs> so so along those lines, you were the very first uh, certified B Corp in in Nebraska. So it was 2014. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What what prompted you to become a B Corp? The primary driver for me was. Um, actually, the, the, the seed was planted as I was contemplating, as many of us do, uh, all of my, my some days. I was going through this, this process of, well, someday I'm going to be able to save enough money or build a big enough company or whatever that I can do something meaningful to honor my parents. You know? And I remember I sat down and was grilling my dad at Thanksgiving a couple of years before we, we became a B Corp. And like, dad, what do you want to be remembered for? You know, I was trying to figure out if like my brothers and I could work our butts off our entire life. And when we're in our sixties, we have enough, we could build a park and name it after my mom and dad or something. I was thinking through legacy and all that. And my dad just started laughing at me. Like, I don't want a hospital wing named after me. Yeah, that's no. Um, all he cared about is that his kids and his grandkids were happy, healthy contributors to society. Um, were leading meaningful lives. It's all he cared about. He didn't care about anything around legacy and I was thinking, well, what am I waiting for? What are we waiting for? And I came back and I sat in the room with my leadership team and they had that look in their eyes, like the deer in the headlights. Oh shit, Jay just went to a conference. Everything's going to change. <laughs> a vintage um, moment, right? Yes, all of that. And I shared with them that we're going to um, we, we're, we're going to change everything about the way we do business. And um, we started going through the process. That ultimately led to us becoming a certified B Corporation. And the reason we chose that path is because it you know it has there's a third party that's validating um, and and audits and validates what what we're doing. So not anyone can just say, hey, yep, I'll pay the money and become this. It's really arduous to become. Oh yeah, I started it. Yeah, uh -huh. it's very hard. Um, and um, and now we have that uh, one of the highest three percent scores in the entire B Corp system as as the years have progressed, um, because we continue to invest in how can we. Um, you know, be less patriarchal, and how can we be more focused on um, on bringing uh, and then not just like hiring and um, and accepting that we need to hire um, people of of more um, ethnicities and cultures, but actually seeking them out. And how do we find them and bring them to us because they're not applying? You know, uh, we, we live in a community that is eighty five percent white, and it's really hard. Um, for years, I used to say, yeah, we've we've hired every person of color that's ever applied. And so far, that's three, you know, and like, 
I used to say that, and then I realized, well, that's ridiculous. Um, that I would, you know, that I would say it's. It sounds like I'm trying to, ex- you know, I'm, I'm coming up with an excuse. Mm-hmm, sure. Um, and then, so we got very intentional about how do we go find people that we can recruit and bring into our community. And um, there are so many things um, that becoming a certified B Corp has opened my eyes to and and trained us to and made it possible for us to really. Um, proceed in a way to build an evergreen company. So Fire Spring, um, all of our team members know this, um, that the intention behind this company is to build a company that endures for more than 100 years and that reinvents itself every seven to 10 years because business changes. We have to kind of reinvent ourselves. And the company is going to be, essentially, it's not going to transfer to my children. My, My children, I have three of them, already know this. They're totally on board. I get the high five, dad. This is awesome. Thanks. They're going to get a little bit of an inheritance for me so that they don't, you know, so, so they have a little bit, um, but that's it. The rest of whatever I build in my lifetime goes right back into my company, which goes to the employees and their families. Um, and it will be an employee owned company for um, for a hundred plus years. And one of the things that I'm working on with the model that was created with Yvonne Chouinard when he did the exit of Patagonia, um, I'm working on finding through the Do More Good movement, finding several. We've now identified seven different similar type models that exist. Um, and our intention is to is to shine a light and give a path to business owners that there's a different way to build and scale a business without having to sell it to a private equity firm, put a bunch of money in your bank account, and then you know make your children all trust fund babies, which I don't believe is a good is a good model. Mm-hmm. So um, we're we're working on trying to figure out a way to help advanced capitalism um, so it is really truly conscious um, in terms of how it how it grows and applies for generations hmm, that's wonderful I I have such the same vision I I I want I don't want this I mean I founded this business and so it's so easy to like be the face of it forever but I don't want that I I no. want it to last through multiple CEOs and and I want it to become an employee owned company as well it's just a it's a it's a hard path you know, yes. the and government doesn't of, make it One easy. of the goals of the Do More mm-hmm. Good movement is to help simplify that path. Mm-hmm. Um, one of our objectives is to create um, c- containers, examples, best, best studies, case studies, and then work with attorneys even in multiple states to create documentation that can be easily applied and obviously updated for each individual circumstance, but take out 80% of, of, of like, because right now, if somebody wants to do what we're, what we're talking about, to create a company that is essentially um, gifted to the employees that then they can grow. Um, the complication in that is ridiculous. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I just started down the path. Down. Yeah, that's started, very yeah exactly. I started down the ESOP path and I was like, Oh my gosh, Yeah. why does this have to be so hard? Yeah. yeah. So that one of the, the f- five year goals that we have at do more good movement is to simplify that structure and process and, give the model away to whoever um, is interested in using it. Ah, I love that. I think on that note, Jay, I think that's a fabulous way to end. So thank you so much for sharing all your insight and your your inspiration to all of us to be better and to do more good. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra.